is a big issue. But that'll give you all. Well, because we need some like all the schools in the area. Do you like these? I mean, do we have to do it? Is there any? No, I mean, you know, you can. school board meeting. The first item on our agenda is adjustments to agenda. Does anybody on the board have an adjustment to make? Uh, request for consideration to have the uh, finance committee receive a uh, report from Dee LaBelle concerning budgetary issues. Okay. Any other adjustments? The second item is approval of the school board minutes, the meeting of March 10th, 1992. Are there any additions or corrections? Yeah, I have a correction, uh, if I can just find it. The, uh, the motion that I made, this is on page 65D, was that we approve a budget of 9385000 and that was after we had discussed the $12,000 from Integrated Arts and $10,000 from Food Services. And then mo that motion failed, five to two. And then we discussed further cuts. None appeared, and then Mark Foray made the same motion essentially again, which I seconded, and that time it passed six to one, as I recall. Any others? Okay, the minutes stand approved. Comments by our middle school representatives. Hello. Um, Christy Sternberg couldn't be with us tonight because the sixth grade is in Chewankee for the week. Um, quite a bit happened this past month, so here goes. Uh, <laughs> um, the student council recently had a dance, which was last Friday, and um, that brought in $355 or thereabouts. Um, the student council is considering helping to fund um, redoing the fitness room in the gym. Mr. Strout presented us with a proposal for a few new exercise bikes, a um, stair climber, and a treadmill. Um, and we, we were thinking about that today, and I think we'll be voting on that a week, in a week or two. Um, we recently had our exploration unit, which was the interdisciplinary unit, last week, and I think that went over pretty well, and everybody seemed to enjoy that. And we recently had our book fair, which was during the interdisciplinary unit. Um, we had several children from our school participate in the Triple C Science Fair um, last Friday. Um, Camille Fitzpatrick and Eric Ferguson both won trophies for third and fourth place respectively. And um, some other participants included um, eighth graders Steve Bevel and in seventh grade Alana Berman and Kate Garmy. <coughs> in on May 6th through 8th the uh, sixth and seventh graders will be having their achievement tests. And um, soon the eighth graders will be culminating their four year high school projects during advisor advisee classes. And the spring sports are well underway now, and the games will start after vacation. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Comments from our high school representatives? Once again this year, several students from the high school will be <coughs> representing Cape Elizabeth at the Speech and Debate Nationals. This year, the Nationals are being held in Fargo, North Dakota, and the students are Peter Hand and Leah Parker in Extemporaneous Speech, John Woodward in Humorous, Josh Broussard in Dramatic Interpretation, and Elizabeth Kirstein and Elizabeth Kerner in, in Debate. 
This year also, CAPE won the sweepstakes trophy at the districts, which was the qualifying meet for the nationals, and also won a special award as a recognition for, for the fact that CAPE has done so well in the past 10 years. Also, our speech coach, Mr. Mullen, was recognized for being so accomplished as a coach. Once again this year, also, the French club took a trip to Quebec. The 13 members from the club recently spent a weekend in Quebec and had the chance to spend some time with French-speaking people and French, in French families. Also, for the past few years, the SAC has been trying to arrange some sort of exchange with another school, which involves going to another school and seeing what, essentially seeing what it's like. Last week, our SAC went to Scarborough for the day and had the opportunity not only to see how Har Scarborough High School runs, but also how the student government there works. And it was also a good chance for, for students to disprove some of the stereotypes which exist between Cape Elizabeth and Scarborough. So it was really a great opportunity for the SAC and we're hoping to have Scarborough come visit us sometime in May. Also, I'd just like to mention that um, the plans for the kindergarten center are now being shown in the lobby at the high school. One of the concerns we had when we heard that the kindergarten was moving that was that a lot of kids wouldn't know what was going on and would wind up at school on the first day with a completely rearranged school, not knowing what had happened. So we're really fortunate to have the chance to see what our school will look like next year, and we're really pleased about that. Thank Great. you. Madam Chairman, may I ask a question of Lori? Lori, I think I read recently that the speech and debate team had asked for public support for their venture out to Fargo, North Dakota. Actually, that's different. The, this year we went to a qualifying meet both for the National Forensic League, which we have money budgeted for to attend the Nationals, and also for the Catholic Forensic League. So two students right now from CAPE are going to the Catholic Forensic Nationals, and this money hasn't been budgeted, so that's what they're looking for money for. But the trip to Fargo is funded. Have you gotten any support from the public that you're aware of to date? I'm not sure, but I know that two of the students who were going to go decided not to because they're going to Fargo also. So right now only two students are going. And I know they've sent out letters to people at home hoping to get some support. So hopefully that will help them out. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK, the next item is the business manager's report. Thank you, Janet. On page 76 in your agenda, we highlight the uh, general program revenues to date. Uh, we have collected 74% or $6.8 million out of, a, out of a projected $9 million too. However, keep in mind that with the shortfall from the state, our projected revenues have been revised so that they will approximately come in at $9,077,000 some odd dollars or a shortfall of $126,282. Based on that, today we have expended uh, $6.5 million, or roughly 72% of our budget. The projected $35,000 balance at year end still looks uh, like it's gonna happen. Any questions on the revenues and uh, expenditures? The following page highlights the federal and state programs for this same period. Uh, to date, we have received $146,000 and have expended $70,000. Uh, most of those monies will be expended come June 30th of this year. The following three pages uh, gives you some idea of what the food service program is doing for this year. For the month of March, we had revenues of $40,000 and expenditures of $32,000, but roughly a $7,700 cash balance. To date, the, the cash, just the cash itself is, is uh, in the red of $1,447. However, page three outlines the fund balance for the school lunch program. And the fund balance to date, counting inventories, receivables, and unpaid bills, has a positive uh, fund balance of $5,600. Compared to last year's negative $9,500, or roughly a $15,000 swing. Uh, community Services Report follows with the next three pages, where their program has 
taken in to date $469,000 and has expended $380,000. I would imagine most of our revenues are in for the year and the rest of the year we'll probably see the expenditure side have some growth. The last page is the enrollment for the month ending, uh, or the month, the 1st of April, 92. We are up one student at the high school compared to last month for a total of 1,615 kids. And the last page is a recap of the energy accounts to date as of uh, March 31st. Notice the, the differences in the electricity account and the uh, fuel oil account. But we have adjusted those to the budget process for next year where we've changed the, uh, the uh, projected uh, usage. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is communications. Thank you. Um, I included in your packet a notice from Maine Lead that calls to your attention that two of our staff members, Betsy Wiley, English Department Chair, and Jill Blackwood, grade seven teacher and team leader at the Cape Middle School, have been accepted into the Maine Academy for School Leaders. Um, the information also explained in more detail um, what that is. I think congratulations are in order for both of those uh, teachers. I'm personally glad to see that they are women. I don't mean to be sexist in that comment, but anyway, I think it's nice to see them. I also included an article that, as a matter of fact, three or four parents sent me or sent, I think perhaps you've also received copies, uh, looking for a renaissance, the campaign to revive education in the arts, and I think we've also had, um, actually they weren't sent directly to me, copies were sent to me, but you've received copies yourselves of uh, parent letters concerned about uh, any possible trend of cutting back on the arts, obviously, in bad budget times. That is a concern, concern to all of us. The challenge is to find a way of keeping the spirit and the, um, at least as much as we can, of those programs alive. Uh, it is a challenge in tough times. Um, also, I have a notification here that um, Barbara Canal, Spanish teacher at the Cape Middle School and Cape High School, was elected president of the Foreign Language Association of Maine during its annual meeting held on um, March 20th. And that's a statewide professional organization, and we're glad to have Barbara represent us on that. And those are my communications. Thank you. Okay. And can I just say one thing about the integrated arts program? I would just like to bring to people's attention that a committee is going to be formed shortly, and including board members, administrators, uh, parents, and teachers, um, to, to look at revamping the arts uh, curriculum, K-4 or K-5. Um, and anybody, any parents who are interested in serving on that committee should uh, give Connie Brown and the superintendent's office a call as soon as possible to let them know of uh, your interest. Okay, thank you. The next item is the superintendent's report. <coughs> thank you. Um, and actually, this is one of those evenings when I'm not making the report. People are making it for me. And our first uh, speaker will be Mary Grabel, who is uh, our uh, Chapter 1 reading uh, specialist at Pond Cove, who has this year been uh, taking the reading recovery training, uh, a really solid and exciting addition to our reading program. Some of you are familiar with it. We've had a couple of um, parent letters on their satisfaction with what's been happening in that. And I asked Mary to give us a brief presentation tonight so that you could hear her uh, enthusiasm. I warn you, she's a real cheerleader. Actually, that's not warning. That's letting you know that she's, um, she's very convincing. Hmm? An hour of your time once, and I sat there and gave a very spirited delivery of reading recovery. And afterwards, Connie said, "Okay, I'm sold. <laughs> Calm down, take a Valium." <laughs> but what I've done is, I know some of you certainly do know a lot about reading recovery, and some of you do not. So what I did is, I put together an overview of the program, and hopefully, it'll answer some questions that you might have about it. And I also have some information that I have run off for you about reading recovery that you may read at your leisure. 
So I will, hopefully this won't be too long, and then I will take questions and I'll hopefully be able to answer them to the best of my ability at this point in my training. <clears throat> Many teachers and parents assume that if early instruction is good enough, failure can be prevented. But regardless of the approach used, some children get off to a poor start in reading. The dilemma is how to respond quickly to such early problems before, before a pattern of failure is established. Reading recovery, a short-term research-based intervention program developed by New Zealand, New Zealand psychologist Mari Clay is designed to help children before school problems develop. Children who show evidence of early difficulties with reading work one-on-one -on -one with a specially trained teacher for 30 minutes each day. Oh, I lost my place. Um, the goal is to bring these children up to the average reading level in their class within 12 to 16 weeks so that they can profit from classroom instruction and continue to improve in reading without extra help. First introduced into the Columbus, Ohio schools in 1984 and 85 as a small scale collaborative venture with Ohio State University, <coughs> reading recovery is now being used in 230 of the state school districts with the full endorsement of the State Department of Education the and the legislature. Eventually the program will reach approximately 15% of all first graders in Ohio. Part of the explanation for this unusual level of support can be found in the positive results recorded by Gaysu Pinnell, Diane DeFord, and Carol Lyons of Ohio State University. In a longitudinal study of the first group of 136 first graders enrolled in the program, the researchers found that most not only caught up with their classmates, but were still keeping pace with them three years later. This finding indicates that reading recovery has an impressive potential to reduce the need for extra support services. In the Columbus study, the lowest 20% of students in some classrooms were randomly assigned either to reading recovery or to a year-long remediation program, i.e. chapter one, or something along that line. In the reading recovery group, the reading recovery group scored higher than the comparison group on all measures of reading achievement. In addition, the researchers monitored results as the program expanded to include thousands of children across the state. Test scores indicate that the statewide effort has produced gains in reading ability comparable to those documented in the Columbus schools. Clay developed the reading recovery program after detailed observation of good readers in the early stages of learning to read. She found that they made use of a variety of cues and could integrate these into the overall process of constructing meaning from text, which is so crucial. Poor readers, while aware of some of the cues, did not know how to apply or build on this knowledge. They especially lacked key strategies such as predicting text from cues, self-monitoring, and self-correction. In the half-hour lessons developed by Clay, a child engages intensely in both reading and writing with the support and guidance of a trained teacher. The child begins by reading aloud for several familiar stories and then a new book introduced the day before. Later in the lesson, a child composes a sentence, writes a message with the aid of the teacher, who then copies it on heavy paper and cuts it up very strategically for the child to reassemble and read. And finally, the child examines and discusses with the teacher the new book that will be read in the next session, and that comes in the form of called a running record. Clearly, in such a program, much depends on the quality of the teacher's moment-to-moment -moment interaction with the child. During the first year in the program, teachers receive intensive training, underline intensive 10 times, supervision and support. Teachers attend a weekly seminar which involves a behind-the-glass observation and discussion of a session in progress. The emphasis is on learning to conduct careful and systematic observations of children's reading and writing. Reading Recovery is a very powerful, positive program that succeeds, and that's been proven with some children from Pond Cove School. In short, it saves most at-risk first grade readers from failure. And it's a really dynamic program, and it's challenged me in ways I cannot begin to tell you. One thing that is asked of a Reading Recovery teacher before you go into your trade is, are you willing to be reflective in your thinking? Are you, are you willing to unlearn everything you have learned about reading? And I said yes and I left everything I knew outside the door and, built and started learning, from re learning about reading from square one. And I'm now at the point where I, my level of understanding is pretty darn good, and it's just a really unbelievable program, and I know 
some of you already show me direct support and some of you are probably just wanting more information, but to fully implement reading recovery at Pond Cove School, we need one teacher for every 50 students. That would cover the bottom 20%. Ideally, I'd like to see us cover the bottom 30% as other districts are doing in my training class. Westbrook is obviously my training site and they plan to cover the bottom 30% and the impact of doing such a thing could be unbelievable for Pond Cove School. Um, that's my goal. Um, I should point out, uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about budget issues as we go along, but um, you realize as we've gone through the final stages of the budget that we had assigned some money for training a second teacher and obviously that's a process we're already engaged in. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions? If I can answer it. I would like to first start off by saying that everything I've heard about your reading recovery program has been positive and that I think it is a tremendous program. Uh, there clearly are children um, in Pond Cove that need identification and, and need the structure and support that you're offering them and obviously there's been tremendous success thus far on the limited basis that we've been able to offer it mm -hmm. to Pond Cove students. Uh, a few questions about it. First of all, um, is, does the Reading Recovery Program have specific recommendations for identification of students? Yes, um, clearly they're looking at some pretty consistent numbers, 15 to 20 or 15 to 30, depending on your resources. And what do you use for identification? The, the tool that I use was developed by Mari Clay. It's called the Diagnostic Summary. And I merely, the children come to me through teacher identification. Um, obviously I can't randomly pick out children. And mm -hmm. what I do is I look at them from A to Z, I ask them everything they know about reading. I have very prescribed questions. I don't randomly ask them. It's, my questions are all very controlled questions. My language I use in reading recovery is very exact, it's very strategic. And when I look at the results of the diagnostic summary, come up with a diagnostic, actually diagnostic, diagnostic survey, and I, then I write up a diagnostic, diagnostic summary. I've had a long day. And from there, I develop a program for the child the program has a set format, but for everything I do, for every child, it's very different because it depends on what the child knows. I don't teach from the unknown for the child. I teach from the known. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to ask him to do something, it's because I know I can make a link to something that he already has in his repertoire of learning. So my understanding is that teachers in the regular classroom identify the child, and then you diagnose and, and address it. So you're not currently involved in identification, it sounds like, of children. I've already identified the children. I already they've already been in reading recovery and what I've done is I identified the children in September with the help of the teachers mm -hmm. uh, came up with the results of their of their survey uh, determined that they, yes definitely where they were at risk I have currently I work with four students at a time uh, research does not support reading recovery teachers working with more than four at a time because the results are not as positive not as great I um, have already tested three children out of the program to the average or better and I immediately taken other children that have been on the waiting list. Is there is it possible to screen all students? It's not necessary to screen all students because we're really looking at the bottom 25 to 20 percent, the children who just don't get it for whatever reason, despite instruction. Okay. There, I mean, there are children who are going to first grade who are reading at grade level or higher, uh -huh. and there's no need to take a look at those children because the they are appropriate. Okay. My second question is, wh what do you perceive to be the s most significant difference in the reading recovery instruction methods as opposed to the standard classroom instruction that's being used currently in Pond Cove? I have no problems with the current instruction at the, uh, that's going on in the classroom at this time. Oh, no, I'm, I'm just curious as to, obviously you're able to offer something pretty remarkable mm -hmm. that, that somehow wasn't there present for them. W what would you It's, it's that not that be? it wasn't present for them, it's just that these children are at risk. And I happen to know that one little boy that I've recently picked up, not only the teacher has come to watch me several times do a lesson because she wanted to use some of the strategies with some mm -hmm. of the children who are at risk in her school, in her classroom that weren't receiving reading recovery. And some of these other children had also been in a small group instruction. And despite all the efforts made on behalf of the remedial person and the classroom teacher, this child didn't get it. And he I'm glad I have him in reader recovery because I think I can hopefully make a difference. Okay, and then one final question. Do, mm -hmm. Is there any movement by the reading recovery program to be able to provide this prospectively mm -hmm. so that children don't have to have the leg time of, of already having some difficulty being identified and, 
-hmm. and then entering reading recovery, are, is it possible that those same tools could be used initially and offered to the children right off the bat and perhaps? By a classroom teacher? By a right. It, read recovery has to be implemented by a trained read recovery teacher. While classroom teachers can benefit from some of the strategies that I'm using, it's very hard for a teacher to understand why that strategy needs to be used at that time. You have to bear in mind that the teaching very strategic and it's for that child at that moment and, the, and if I'm going to do that strategy at that moment for that child I have, I have to have a good reason for it and I have to understand where that child is in his development to orchestrate that strategy and for a teacher while as, it, as I said she could model some of the reading recovery it's not as effective because she doesn't understand the theory as to why she's doing that this is a theory based program it just kids fall through the cracks okay thank you I, Oh, if I can answer it. Thank you. Um, Mary, I think that the presentation tonight was uh, excellent, and I was just wondering, knowing that there are restrictions of copyright and distribution of materials under the reading recovery, is it, <coughs> excuse me, possible to get basically the text of your presentation tonight oh, sure. in type form? Oh, uh, or something. Oh, o only because I'm a person who has oh, sure. a desire and a... Uh, oh. A learning need to, to look at things and hear them. Thank you very much. Sure, and just one other thing before I, I close, if there are any other questions. Now we have other questions. Ann? Ann? It, you and I have talked about this privately, but could yeah. you just explain for people who don't know um, anything about reading recovery why this is just targeted at first grade children and it's not used with the, with the upper grades? Right. The reason why reading recovery is, is targeted for the first grade is because we get the children very young before some severe confusions have been set in. They're confused, but it's not severe. The, and research does not support reading recovery in the second or third grade because those children take too long to exit out of the program. Reading recovery is expensive. My training is, I guess, moderately expensive, and we want to, you want to get the most money out of your training dollar, and that would be in the form of getting children in and out of the program. If I were to work with four second graders, I'd have to work with them all year long. As it is, I'm, I will currently be able to work with eight first graders because I can get those children in and get them out by January. So that's the reason why we don't really implement the program. Yes? If you're using, you're, you have four children at a time with you. Well, no, it, in a one-on-one -on -one session, yes. But they're four all in your room at the same time? No, I work with the children in a 30-minute session, one at a time. So you're, but where does the four come in? I'm sorry? The four. Be, re, the reading recovery model says that a reading recovery teacher work with four students during the course of the day. That could be in a half day model or I could do, I do two in the morning, two in the afternoon because it's too intense to do four in a row. And then what do you do the rest of the day? Uh, chapter one. Chapter one. So it is one on one, completely. Reading recovery is strictly one on one. It is not small group. It doesn't work. <laughs> In our system, the 20% the that we have in the program, um, number-wise, how does that compare with the 20% that are in other systems? Do we have a fairly large number of? Ours are right on target. There are, and I'm, because of all the other districts involved, I work with people from uh, Turner and Green and obviously Westbrook. Our numbers are not significantly higher or lower than anybody else's. And for the kids that, I mean, I think reading recovery is, is great, and I'm sure it, it helps the kids. I guess I'm concerned about all of the other kids in the system. I certainly think that the strategies that you've described could be well applied as far as assessment and the mm -hmm. testing and right. the running records and mm -hmm. everything. I mean, to me, that sounds like a good, solid reading program and assessment for any child. It is. And, and I would hope that maybe a lot of what you're doing will translate into the classroom and I would not like to see this program be used for everything to stay status quo in all, all of the classrooms and say that's okay we have reading recovery. Right. Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that doesn't happen? The teachers are very very interested in, in what reading recovery does and what it says and how it deals with, with print and as I said the teachers have to come in very aggressively to watch what was going on. Uh, Sue Welch made that possible um, the teachers have time to come in and spend moments with me to garner some, all the information they can. 
I, I don't, I've never dealt with a teacher who said, I don't have to give this child a reading assessment because it's being done in reading recovery. The reading recovery child not only gets that intense 30 minute lesson, he gets the beauty of the classroom instruction on top of that. So, and they have, and because we have such beautiful literature based classrooms, I obviously use literature in reading recovery. Uh, he really gets a double dose of really e good reading approaches through reading recovery and the classroom. Since we've started reading recovery and we're now catching the first grade children who have fallen through the cracks, is there another program out there that, that should be implemented for the second and third grade children that we missed that have fallen through the cracks? My hope is no, unfortunately not. And I'd like to say that Chapter 1 dealt with those children, but it doesn't. And I can say that because I've been a Chapter 1 teacher for six years and it doesn't work. Reading recovery works. It's going to take us a while to feel the full impact of reading recovery in our schools if we decide to fully implement the program. If we decide to fully implement it, it'll take us three years and it'll probably take us another four to five years to really see the long-term impact of the program where suddenly children going into second and third grade don't have any concerns. If they have math concerns, that's different. But, it, but, but because reading recovery is also one component is the writing component, it also helps to really get the writing skills up to uh, grade level. So it's going to take some time for, them, for there to be a long-term impact where you can look and say, oh, suddenly we don't need this service in this grade level. Mm -hmm. But I think that will be when we fully implement reading recovery. But I do have some things that I will leave with uh, Beth Henderson. I have some articles that you might find interesting. One of them is Reading Recovery, a Viable Prevention of Learning Disability. Though clearly we, we do need special ed and this is certainly no replacement. But it's an interesting article. Reading, reco uh, reading Intervention for High Risk First Graders. Um, as we see at Classroom Teachers View, Reading Recovery. And something I thought that you might enjoy reading is uh, Reading Recovery, a Cost Effectiveness and educational outcome analysis. The Wareham, Massachusetts School Department carefully looked at the cost effectiveness of reading recovery before they implemented it. And they did a, a nuts to bolts look on right down to the last penny about what program is cheaper to implement. And it's clearly reading recovery as opposed to any other thing that's out there. So I will leave those with Beth, or maybe I'll leave them with Connie at the office. And I would encourage any one of you who is interested to come see a behind the glass. Connie, we're going get to get you out there well, for the I've end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it, you can see it in action and really talk to the teacher leader afterwards to get some further clarification. Am I all done? <laughs> so is anybody have so. any other questions? Thank you. Thanks Thank you very much. much. Thank you, Mary. <clears throat> Moving on, uh, Lyle Kramer is here to give you a quick summary on the eighth grade MEAs. Thank you, Connie. Connie asked me to make it fast, so instead of skipping through the whole report like I have done in the past, I'll stick strictly to page two tonight. Uh, to the right of page two, that gives you a breakdown of the numbers of students who were tested. I'd like to point out that 100% of our students were tested, which is far in excess of the uh, numbers statewide. Uh, all, of our, we, all of our students uh, were tested, even the 19% who were classified as special education. Uh, if you move over to the left of that page, You'll notice that five of the six scores are up this year. The reading score on a scale of 1 to 400 was 355. The writing score, 330. Mathematics was 400. Science was 400. Social studies was 340. And humanities was 370. If you switch to the any questions about that before I go on to uh, the report that I sent you? Um, in my memorandum, at the bottom of the page, or the first page, I've responded to the request that you folks made of me the last time I reported to you, and that was to list the grade level scores in each subtest since the main assessment tests have been given. 
and that starts with year 1985-86 and goes through the year 1991-92. <coughs> and that would be for all of the different grades that have been tested at that grade level over the past few years. We move on to the next page. That's where we that's where I take a look at the gender gap. As I pointed out, the gender gap is there this year and it's all in favor of the girls, with the exception of the boys going a little bit higher in science. Charlie? In the special needs children, do we have a higher percentage of boys in this class than we have girls? Yes, and I would guess that that might attribute to the reason that the girls are scoring higher. I'm not sure that would be the total reason, but I suspect that that would make, <coughs> make up for a big part of the difference. The, the other observation that I noticed is that our special needs kids do seem to score almost 100 or more points above the state average also. Right. And that's pointed out in my next chart there. What I have done is to list the average score of the handicapped students compared to the remaining other students in the class. And I compared that for Cape Elizabeth and then I compared that for the state. And as Charlie pointed out, you can see that our scores of our handicapped population greatly exceed the average scores for the handicapped students statewide. The least amount of difference, of course, is 71 points, with the greatest amount of dis uh, the greatest difference being 179 points. And as I glanced through the papers, the uh, scores that were published in the Sunday paper, our handicapped stores scores would be comparable to a fair number of average school scores across the state. One other question uh, about the handicap. Do you think this class has a higher percentage than previous classes that have tested at this grade? Yes, it's higher than pre previous classes. I checked with the special education director, and she said that the average is 13% per grade level, and this is 19%. So this, this percentage is six points higher than the average for Cape Elizabeth in this particular grade level. Okay, then moving on to the... No, 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 it's okay. Let me, I'll wait till he's done. Okay. Then moving on to the last chart, we are not supposed to make this kind of comparison, but everybody does, as I pointed out. Um, the reason that we're not supposed to make that kind of comparison is that over the number of years between the fourth grade and the eighth grade, uh, a lot of students move in and out of the state so that the norm that you're looking at is different than it was four years ago. And the same thing is true for our students here. About 25 to 30 percent of our students will, have, will be different students compared to when we test the fourth grade. And that is enough of a percentage so that you shouldn't make direct comparisons. But if you do do that, you will notice that all six subtests increased. Would it be easy for you to weed out the students that have come into the system and just actually compare exact students with your fourth and eighth grade score? You all, I, I know you usually qualify, qualify that, and it seems like it wouldn't be a problem at all to just go back and... Yep, yes, that can be done. I've done it before. And then we'd have a, a truly accurate picture and, and wouldn't have to qualify. As a matter of fact, I did a little study of the number of points that I categorized the amount of gain and took a look at how many students had increased at each grade level. Mm -hmm. I will do that if, if the school boards are do any, you, Does it any have any like. meaning to you? I mean, do you think it would be significant to the system? I think it would be useful. I do too. Appreciate you doing that. Um, Lyle, in addition to that, could you give the numbers of students and how many were boys and how many were girls? 
I, and I think it was two years ago was the last time we saw those numbers publicly. Understanding they're not perfect, but yeah. it certainly would be. It'd be okay if I wait for the summer to do this? Uh, <laughs> we can't Real do anything right about now. it now. <laughs> I do have another question back on the um, gender gap that occurred pretty remarkably in these scores. Uh, on those scores, w w some appear to be more statistically significant than others. Are you mean in terms of the number of points? Right, in terms yes. of, a, a, for instance, a 20 point difference in the gap is probably not within measuring error. It probably is within measuring error and probably not a significant But difference. just barely significant. Right, as opposed right. to a 113 point swing is clearly significant and probably indicative of something very different occurring between the boys and girls group. Right. And that's been pretty consistent, close to that amount of difference for the quite a few years. So, so it's very clear that there is a wide gap in, in performance between boys and girls in language arts at Cape Elizabeth. Certainly nationally, the, the shift has, and the effort has been to address math and science curriculums to be better suited uh, for girls' instruction, and there's been a lot of research into that in terms of how those particular curriculums are presented to students versus spatial versus sequential learners, for instance, and some feeling that spatial <coughs> ideas in the math and sciences need to be emphasized in order to bring girls more into those fields. Uh, I really do have some significant concerns about the boys at Cape Elizabeth if they're scoring 287 in the language arts program. Um, and I, I think if that's a recurrent problem that we see in these tests, it's something that we should look at and find out if our curriculum is not addressing boys' needs specifically, um, and it, if it looks statistically that, that that's likely to be true. One of the things I would also ask you to, if you'd be willing to do this summer is to find out whether there is a very large shift related to special needs students or whether that's, that's our, our average student differential. And if there is that wide of a differential between boys and girls, I think we need to research some of our curriculum to find out if boys are receiving the short end of the language arts curriculum in our school. If, if we look at the, the MEA um, handout that, that was in our packet, if you look at under reading, um, under identified handicap condition, 19% of our children that were tested had a score of 171. 81% had a score of 395. I think the gender gap is, is depressed because of the, the increase in the number of handicapped boys in that group. It, I, I'm sure that it has some significance, <coughs> but at the same time, if you look at the difference between the boys and girls scores at the state level, you'll notice the girls outscore the boys across the state by 82 points. So, so there is some impact there, I think, because of the number of handicapped boys that we may be having. But at the same time, I, I remember each year um, the state and the commissioner of education and there have been lots of national inquiries, as, as you pointed out, about girls receiving low, low science and math scores. And I've consistently said to different boards, you folks, most of you have heard this before from me, is that what we really need to look at is what's happening with the boys in reading and writing. Um, the reading has always been a similar pattern, but more in line with what the writing is this year of the you know, 89, 90 points, as I recall from past years. But this is one of the things that I can do, is go back and pull out uh, history, a history of, of uh, that difference, too. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's great that the math and science scores are up, but I, I am concerned that about this pattern with the reading, writing, uh, social studies, and humanities. And has any analysis been done about why those scores stay so low? Those aren't low either. over the years. <laughs> huh? Those aren't really well, low. Well, if we can if we can get to 400 in math and science, I, I don't see why we can't get to. 400 and all the other categories as well, and I'm just wondering why, if we know why, why we don't. Well, it's, well, you're, you're top of the state in those two scores. Um, what you're asking for is us to be at the very top 
across the state, and that's certainly a good goal. Uh, remember, I, if you look at this graph that I passed out, is kind of a supplement, is an appendix. You'll notice that, that if our students score between 350 and 400, that still puts you in the top 3% of the schools across the state. I, I, ju I just believe that if we can do it in math and science, we probably can do it in those other areas too, if, if we look at the programs and, and address it and address that as a goal. Um, so I, I would like to see some kind of analysis of what, what we may be doing right in math and science or where we're not addressing needs in the other areas, because I really do believe we could be across the board. Um, the, it is, I can look at the math and reading and writing scores and give you some breakdown of where our students score there. It is very diff difficult to do that in the areas of humanities, social studies, and science because um, those scores are not reported back to either the school or the parents. And as a matter of fact, there are 12 forms of the test so that only about, it takes about eight groups of 12 to make up a whole test. It's what they call cross matrix sampling. And uh, so not even, only, only about five or six, about seven or eight of our kids actually take a whole test. See, it's done strictly for assessment of programs within the school and comparing one school to another. And there's no norming done at all for individual students there. Loretta? Nancy Hutton, last year didn't you do some kind of an analysis? Was it the eighth grade tests that you went back and took a careful look at the patterns that our children were missing? Uh, is that being followed up this year, or are, do we know if any of those were? We, we haven't done the same kind of analysis, but um, we could. We could go back and we could do this thing that Lyle was talking about, especially in the gender issues, um, and looking for those in reading and writing and mathematics. The science, as you mentioned, science, social studies, and humanities is so difficult to do. Um, but we can do that. We have been working this year with the University of Southern Maine to um, correlate. Our students took a survey on how do I take standardized tests? And then they're correlating their test results with that. We do not have all that information back yet, but hopefully we will shortly. Um, so that's an analysis this year. We can go back and do the other one that we've done before, though, um, to answer some of the questions that Mark brought up earlier. Did you find that the teachers used that data in their teaching this year, or was it shared with them? Oh, oh yes, it was shared with them, but some of the same behaviors, like not going back and rereading unless you absolutely have to, our students are still doing that. They, they go back when they absolutely have to, but if you don't have to, they don't see it to carry forth with them. That's one of the things that the survey on how you take standardized tests, that's one of the pieces of information that's on there. So that's one of the reasons we we're interested in doing that survey. Mark? Uh, I, I, when there are really unusual results on a test or something that is not within the norm and sticks out, I, I think it certainly does bear further study and research, and I applaud you for doing that. One of the things that I would really hope that we would do is direct those efforts towards the curriculum rather than test taking approaches. Um, certainly there are better test takers and you know less strong test takers, but I think overall the test is an, I is an idea of where the students are. And to a large extent, I think we should accept that that may be reflecting our curriculum and not simply just the approach to the test. And then in addition to you know, encouraging students to be conscientious in their test taking skills, if the problem is that they don't revisit the question, perhaps that's a part of the curriculum that we need to address more strongly in terms of how research is conducted, re revisiting an initial text so that you have to do more reflective writing, for instance, and so that it gets beyond just addressing the test and addressing the curriculum that may have brought about those lower test scores. I, I would agree with, with what Mark said. And we, we've paid an awful lot of attention um, this year to the language arts curriculum at Pond Cove. And I think it, it may be appropriate to move our focus uh, a, a little more broadly and see if we can't address 
some of these issues in the upper grades as well. When the scores are mostly between 350 and 400, they just vary from year to year within that range. <coughs> you said that in that range, it's not a significant mm, jump, right? If it's 350 or if it's 400, is that right? Yes. Then if the, if the range is between that for almost every year and almost every area, then is it not mostly a factor of the particular class that's taking the test? Well, there's a whole variety of variables that will cause that fluctuation. Now, some grade levels have gone well below the 350, as we've talked about at other evenings. Uh, when our scores basically fluctuate among the scores of 350 to 400, I'm just saying that keep in mind that that means that you're talking about a rearrangement of placement among the top 3% of schools in the state. Mm -hmm. Uh, and lots of factors can cause you to move from third to first to second, et cetera. And uh, you know, if our sports teams were all finishing in the top three statewide, you'd be, for the most part, pretty pleased with that, if all of our sports were there. Some do consistently, but, uh, you know, when, when you're looking, one of the things that happens when this test is norm is that the normal curve that is usually pictured in the one that I presented to you, that's usually spread out. The, the curve that is used for the state, or that is developed by state scores, is very narrow, which means that a few more questions, correct or wrong, will move a school system up or down pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. Well, I just wanted to comment on that because after the scores were published in the Sunday paper, I did get a number of calls, and I suspect uh, other board members did too, uh, to the effect that uh, several sur surrounding communities had gotten several more 400s than we had. And uh, I think what you said is very important that uh, actually if you're above 350, you're in the top 2.27%. Uh, those are the t first two standard deviations. Uh, maybe we could do a little better, but there's not a lot of room once you're in that top 2%. You could add them very quickly. Well, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I, I think we've also all heard um, many times that people want us to stop only comparing ourselves to other schools in, within the state and compare ourselves nationally. Obviously, we can't do that with this particular test, but I think we need to put it in context and, and not uh, you know, I, th I think it's good we're doing, you know, a very good job, but I think there's always room for improvement, and I think we can do that in that constructive, positive way. And, you know. I think another, uh, I'll just share this with you, it's not directly related to what you're doing, but at the request of uh, one former school board member, uh, uh, we have been looking at some statistics of our SAT uh, uh, results over the last 11 years. And it's extraordinary that the top 10% of our graduating class have results that, uh, and I wish I'd brought them with me, but uh, the, the mean is about 1,300 combined on verbal and mathematics, which is really quite extraordinarily good. And it was certainly uh, quite a few points higher than I expected. And I, I think we probably ought to give some publicity to that, uh, you know, to those outcomes. And, and I really don't think you can discount the fact that only 6% of special needs or handicapped children are, are tested statewide, and we test 19, I mean, we test all our students. So that is a factor. 13%? We test 19, the state tested 6% statewide. We're handicapped. And we tested 19% of our... Oh, I misunderstood. I thought he said 13 percent. He said usually we have an average of 13 percent of handicapped children in a class. This is a little higher than normal. If you look back on page two, you'll notice that the state test 50 per, 57 percent of the handicapped. I mean, 57 percent of the students are included in this report. So even though the state only has 
six percent of the student body identified with a handicapping condition they ex exclude almost half of those students from the report whereas we have all of our students in there in this particular year in this particular report and that will make you know you asked about what puts one school ahead of the other towards the top if you take three percent of the very lowest out that will make quite a bit of difference when you average I just want to clarify, uh, Ann got me started on uh, our comparisons to other, uh, other communities. In the studies that we've been doing at the high school, incidentally, we didn't focus just on a given segment. We've been looking at, at all the students, and I just mentioned one group as an example, but basically uh, the statistics show that uh, on balance we are improving nationally across the board. Are, are we going to see these? statistics sometimes? Well, you, we're not, they're not a secret, otherwise I wouldn't have mentioned them, but uh, we've just been uh, working on them, and uh, uh, yes, they, they will be, uh, uh, we, we will not keep them from you or from the public. <laughs> okay. I just have a comment for Lyle. Lyle, I want to thank you very much for putting this in such uh, easy to read format compared to all the number crunching you did to uh, make it easy for us to read, and I appreciate it very much. Thank you. I try to keep things simple. I like it. And I, I would like to see some kind of follow-up as to why the difference in the boys' and girls' scores in reading and writing. That, to me, was the most significant point in the, in the report. One other comment. Lyle lives in a community which showed a significant increase in their MEA scores and nothing was different in the way they were teaching these kids except the motivation before taking that test. So I think that's another factor. And I, I wasn't going to say this, but I will as a follow-up. I, I know there are people that somehow don't realize the value of taste te test taking techniques, but it's very critical for teenagers uh, probably much more so as the eighth grade level than as the fourth grade level. So I do support a quickie run through of what the rules are and what the, uh, uh, you know, how to take and read a question so that you give the right answer instead of just making a careless mistake. And I don't think that has to take a semester. But, uh, you know, just a review of that. So, Peter? I think we're getting a little far afield, but yes. I'm going to go further afield uh, and just draw your attention, Rosemary, and everybody else, that there's a very interesting article in today's Wall Street Journal, a lead article on test-taking techniques, uh, particularly with regard to the SAT tutoring courses, and it's, uh, it's a subject of some controversy, but uh, if you're interested in that subject, uh, get today's Wall Street Journal. Maybe we ought to have our eighth grade students read it and then take a test. <laughs> um, I, this was just a related question about the achievement tests. Are these, were you talking in here about the achievement tests that the eighth grade is taking? Oh. The, the former SRA tests? No, that would be for the grade levels other than grades four and eight. Okay. Um, one thing that I was wondering is um, do we have to do the testing when they tell us? It's time to do the testing, or can we choose the time to Other test than the kids? MEAs, we can do whatever we want to, whenever we want to. I'm just wondering if right after vacation is the best time to do it, um, when the kids are coming back possibly uh, tired or distracted or haven't really have been away from the classroom for a while or not. I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just wondering. Uh, I can <coughs> tell you that's been discussed a lot. and. Uh, there are a large number of factors that range from being at Chewankee to uh, Little League tryouts and games <laughs> and fatigue in that respect. And different teachers even, like the parents, have many different views. And this is the first year that we'll be doing testing in a couple of different grade levels at different times to try to accommodate some of those different variables so that we can arrive on quote, optimum time. We give it a lot of attention, believe me. Thank you very much, Lana. Thank you, Lana. Um, considering the amount of time we have here, I'm going to zip right through here and uh, see how much I can cover, because I know we have a number of issues here. Uh, 
The transition team, I just want to report that we have been meeting. That's a team we put together with representatives from, uh, we have some kindergarten parents, we have uh, teachers, administration, school board, and so on. Um, we are moving along with that. We have uh, concrete plans now from the architect. We have a timeline. I believe we we have it under control. There are, of course, every week something else comes up that we hadn't thought about before, but I think things are, are uh, representative of a wide range of, of issues, and we're moving as closely towards consensus as we can get. Uh, I just want to quickly note on, on budget issues that the uh, uh, since our last board meeting, we did in fact have some a uh, couple of workshops and we have met with the town council and I understand that Peter will uh, bring up under his finance subcommittee report the final bottom line on our budget. Uh, I don't need to go into that in detail right now, just to point out that we have a, an agreement with the town council to uh, do some short-term borrowing, which did bring the bottom line for our spending down and uh, we removed um, a couple of items from the budget that were in there as um, hedges for things that we thought we might need that at this point we, we think we can handle in other ways, um, concrete issues of one kind or another. And I assume that we will have a, a bottom line vote under your Correct. report. All right, thank you. And my final piece, I included a copy of something called the Beacon School application, which is something that the State Department is inviting districts throughout the state to uh, um, consider applying for some monies for um, laying literally a Beacon School District on math and science improvement, particularly since we have a notable effort, K-12, in uh, math instruction, perhaps an equally notable lack of a system-wide committee anyway in science. We saw this as an opportunity to um, get our act together and really uh, push for what it is we think our vision in those two areas would be. Uh, this is not to in any sense um, downplay our efforts in language arts, reading, et cetera, but an opportunity that the state is uh, inviting us. I will keep you informed. If you've read the material, you know that we have a pretty tight timeline. We also have an impressive list of people throughout this, the district, teachers mainly, but also some uh, parent and student representation <coughs> on here, and we will be getting together and letting you know more about that. And those okay. are my items. Thank you. School board subcommittees and reports. The first is the finance subcommittee report, Peter Leslie. Okay. Thank you. Uh, as the superintendent mentioned, we met with the town council, and uh, after discussing uh, with them our budget and uh, you know their view of uh, the overall town budget, we uh, agreed to reduce our budget uh, principally by pushing some of the capital expenditures that we had uh, scheduled for next year uh, and finance them over a three-year period. Uh, that amounted to about $176,000. So what we have in bottom line is a total budget, which is precisely the same amount we had last year, which is $9,203,774. Uh, and uh, we should, uh, as a formality tonight, uh, approve that budget, and I'll just pass out for the benefit of those of you who don't have that with you, a copy of that. And uh, I would move that we uh, accept that budget of uh, 9203000 dollars Dollars, okay. and that is my motion. And that is also the end of my report. I hope. Do I hear a second, Rosemary? Further discussion, Charlie. I just have a comment about uh, having attended last night's town council meeting with the superintendent to show support for her presentation for our um, to get their approval for our um, applying for any kind of state aid or state approval that. The question was asked by a fellow board member where the town is, is hung up on their own budget, and it is on how they are going to fund their ladder truck. So it's a matter of, of, one, of 0.1 to 0.49 percent, on, and that's where they're hung up. So I think we, were, we did a very good job in coming to a consensus, even though there was disagreement on the board. 
for any other discussion? All in favor? Okay. Yeah, thank you. That is the end of my report, uh, unless uh, well, any of my fellow uh, Finance Committee members have comments. Uh, Mark has. The, my uh, suggestion is that in an effort to streamline the meetings uh, of the school board, which tend to become somewhat prolonged, that we have the uh, annual or the, the uh, monthly business manager's report presented to the Finance Committee. And then if there are any concerns that the Finance Committee has regarding that report, they would be brought to the board as a whole. Okay, that's okay with me. We did uh, last year change the business uh, manager's report to quarterly and just handed out the, uh, uh, the monthly reports without uh, the business manager making any comments at our meetings. Uh, so we're only uh, actually speaking with the business manager once every three months. It's my understanding that every month, though, we have, don't, do we, we review the business manager's yeah. report at each reading. meeting. We read it? We don't read it, but uh, agenda item number four on this month's agenda, we reviewed the numbers for the uh, month of March. It was my understanding that uh, he only came forward if we had questions. That's not is been that, the practice thus far. What's going it's on? Been no, he, he is. He's presented at every every monthly well, board meeting. At a minimum, we ought to go back to what I thought we decided to do last year. Uh, didn't we decide to do that last year? Yes, just quarter. I would still make my suggestion. It's okay with me. So not even quarterly reports, but to the Finance Committee instead? And, and then as a part of the Finance Committee report, we could receive updates quarterly perhaps, mm -hmm. or a, as was needed regarding any specific issues that you found with the Finance Subcommittee. Rosemary? Um, just as a matter of discussion, uh, perhaps there are some board members that are less interested in the numbers than other board members. But I would suggest that those board members who would like to receive the entire business manager's report in their packet do that. Those who don't want it, say so. Uh, and that uh, we contact uh, Mr. LaBelle in advance of the meeting uh, and ask him any questions, which we sometimes answer uh, at the podium. You'll notice for the past three months, I haven't asked him any questions because I've resolved them all before the uh, meeting. But. Uh, we can certainly speed things along, but I would like to know that Mr. LaBelle will be at the uh, school board meeting, so in case there's a question as a resource person. Um, but I agree with Mark that uh, a long report is unnecessary. Mark? I would, I would agree with uh, Rosemary that all the school board members should have the paperwork in their packet, and I certainly am very interested in reviewing those every month as I have been, uh, but in order to expedite the actual school board meeting have it just addressed from the Finance Committee Chair. Yeah, I, I certainly uh, second the, uh, the notion rather than the motion that uh, every one of us has the obligation to look at the monthly report. Uh, I wonder if uh, we're not, though, just overlooking the, the fact that there may be members of the public that are used to hearing about our finances in this, uh, in this forum. And uh, should we just give a moment's thought to that? Uh, should the Finance Committee, for example, uh, draw the public's attention to things that are going on, that uh, the status of the accounts? Uh, because what you're, you, what, what you're suggesting might be, you know, the end result would be that the public would hear nothing about uh, our finances. No, what my suggestions were that you would report on any significant changes that you felt were appropriate for the board and the public to know at that time. In addition, all <coughs> finance subcommittee meetings are open to the public and, and public notice is held for those meetings if there was an individual interested in hearing the business manager's report. Um, it, we could send um, through the school newsletters, uh, parents' newsletters, the question, do you care? Uh, about the monthly business manager's report. We could also put it on channel 38 for those residents who are not uh, in the school system and see if there is any feedback. Because I raised the question when uh, Mark uh, brought this up earlier was do we have a legal responsibility to discuss this publicly on a quarterly basis and to state what the figures are and I don't know. 
One of the things that uh, any district of any size does is to have a kind of automatic vote where the material is all available to the public and goes out either in a packet form similar to ours or is made available upon request. Um, but uh, any, we're, we have the luxury as a small district sometimes to have public discussion of items that frankly a larger district simply can't do. So from a business like point of view, you, I think that in the various suggestions that have been made here this evening, we can come to some sense of housekeeping rules. Um, I can probably show you or discuss with the chair uh, some samples that I'm aware of, and maybe we can come up with something that will both address the fact that that information is vital to us. We have no intention of hiding it. It is certainly important, but it is too complicated to even begin to address, even in the summary form we have here, and uh, we can come up with something I think that will be workable. Is that agreeable? Okay. Thank you. Co-curricular committee report. Dr. Goldman. Okay. We've, uh, just for anybody's uh, information who is a little unsure of the terms, um, stipends are paid teachers for those activities <coughs> that exceed the regular teacher day. They're the two most common types are the kind that uh, involve making possible student activities. For instance, athletic stipends are, are self-explanatory. Co-curricular in this district refers to those items such as drama, uh, certain kinds of music activities that exceed the school day, et cetera, et cetera, speech, debate, um, and uh, those kinds of things. Uh, the point is that they are student activities coached by either teachers or uh, people who may be outside of our um, own personnel who are paid a stipend for doing those things. We have language in our contract that uh, gives us a process by which we review both the appropriateness of the uh, activity from time to time, also review the stipend paid. Uh, last month you had a report from the athletic um, fee committee. We have had one meeting on the co-curricular, which is reviewing some of the questions that have arisen um, frequently, for instance, from year to year. You have to review, does this activity really take as many hours as it was originally taking? and we may have to come up with suggestions for adjusting the fees, uh, that type of thing. We will have another meeting on, I think it's May 11th is our next meeting, to continue that process. In the meantime, our contract also calls for us to bring to you uh, by April 15th um, a list of whoever we have uh, already discussed as uh, coaches for those two activities, and that is under new business, under personnel request. And when we get to that point, I will add a couple of uh, names that have come in since then, but that's essentially what the business of the co-curricular committee report is, um, just a review and um, a process that's outlined in the contract. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, the joint study committee, uh, which is the merging of the career ladder and the index, the full committee has not met again. However, there will be representatives from the committee going into the schools to meet with the teachers to go over the revised career ladder document so that uh, teachers can ask questions and have full explanations of what the committee uh, developed. Town Center Committee, Rosemary. Uh, yes, Madam Chairman, the uh, Town Center uh, Committee met last Wednesday and unfortunately because I was double scheduled I did not attend and as of this morning, I uh, have not received the minutes of that uh, meeting, but please be assured that any changes, or um, whether significant or, or uh, not, I will report to the uh, school board when they impact the uh, schools or surrounding area. Community team? Uh, yes, Madam Chairman, the uh, community team will not meet during the month of April uh, because uh, they are well, in part because of the school vacation, but because there will be intensive training in the next couple of weeks, which will take time of its members <coughs> away. That's the end of my report. Unfinished business, school board policy, second reading. Any additions or corrections to the policies that we looked at last time? <coughs> okay. And do I hear a motion to accept Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Thank you. New business, personnel requests. Uh, do you want to 
Why don't I kind of run down these? I also have to add, um, I have two items to add to that. Okay. Uh, in the last uh, two board meetings, actually, we have mentioned the issue of job share. Uh, we've had some um, discussions about that. We will have in the packet later under new business um, consideration of a first reading of a job share policy. I hope that that will clarify things for future discussion. In the meantime, uh, it is my recommendation that we grant the request for a job share at the kindergarten grade level for Ingrid Stressinger and Leslie Knowlton. Um, tied to that would be a second a transfer from kindergarten to the second grade, from a request from Lynn Evans, who has been teaching at the kindergarten level. Um, the I might as well go on, I guess, in, in as a matter of expediting this. Those are sort of tied together. Uh, you have a letter of resignation in your packet from Beth Sandmeyer, who has been working as a speech therapist. Uh, she and her husband are relocating or going back to the uh, Middle West. And I have, since I put out the agenda, received a letter of resignation from Tracy Hyde, who has been with us this year as a special education teacher at the middle school. Um, in addition to those requests, we have a request for a second year of child care leave from Kelly Manahan. And I have, since the packet went out, had a conversation with Marie Hayes, who was teaching art at the uh, Pond Cove School. Um, and she would like to ask for a, a leave, uh, unpaid year's leave, so that she can accompany her husband in his um, uh, transfer to Chicago for the upcoming year. So. A variety of requests. You can vote on them as one if you wish, or you can vote on them as combinations, or you can go down the list. Uh, to expedite things, is there any objection from any board member to voting on them as a whole list? I have no objections as long as we include that in a motion, not just say approved. I wish we would state what the motion is. Well, what we can do is state each one of these yes. specific items in our minutes. Okay. I'll make a motion. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chairman, I move that we accept the job share kindergarten uh, position of Ingrid Stressinger and Leslie Knowlton, that we uh, approve the second grade transfer of Lynn Evans, that we accept the resignation of speech therapist Beth Sandmeyer, we accept the resignation of Tracy Hyde, special education, that we grant Kelly Manahan a second year unpaid child care leave, we accept the resignation of Marie Hayes. I beg your pardon. We accept the one year leave of absence without pay of uh, Marie Hayes. And that's all. Did you get Tracy Hyde on there? Yes. yes. Yep. That's all. Second time. Further discussion? Uh, just for point of clarification, in the job share kindergarten situation, one will take an AM and one will take a PM. That's class. correct. Thank you. All in favor? Okay, consideration of the superintendent's nominations for a continuing contract teacher and for a second year probationary teacher. Okay. Um, and uh, this is the time of year when we do uh, go through those issues. I included in your packet on the list that will be uh, Madam Reba at the uh, for second year to continuing contract and Michael Efron. Uh, strange what may seem, uh, since he's been in the district for a number of years, um, is, however, now on a teaching contract and uh, recommending for a second year. Do I hear a motion to accept so both moved. those nominations? Se uh, second? Further discussion? All in favor? Okay. Thank you. In your packet, you have a list of uh, appointments for next year for the coaching and co-curricular positions. I, again, since that went out, and this, of course, does happen at this time of year, either we uh, overlook something because it's a long list, or, in fact, something gets added. I would like to add two names to the coaching list. These are positions already in place and people have already held them. This will be a reappointment for next year. Andy Strout, Assistant Athletic Director and the high school house manager, Sam Boothby. Do I hear a motion? Oh, I'm sorry. I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Connie, I think you uh, answered this earlier uh, in reference to another uh, issue, and that is the reason that we're voting on these year after year in the April meeting mm -hmm. is because of contract language. 
That's correct. And that's the only reason? Well, you would be voting on these uh, year after year anyway. All Schedule B uh, appointments are year to year. In some cases, uh, for instance, no, most notably, the past practice has been with some of these positions to make them uh, two-year reappointments, uh, depending on how they're set up. Uh, but they, it is necessary for the board to vote on them. Anything that is a piece of negotiated stipends, positions, and so on, um, we should periodically be doing that. I discovered last year that we seem to be doing the coaching ones, but we didn't seem to be doing the co-curricular, so we're making an effort to bring them in on schedule. I do have a follow-up. Um, my concern is uh, not that we vote on these year after year, which I believe is the way it should be. My concern is that we are reappointing coaches for the spring season next year without the athletic director having the opportunity to evaluate the performance in the spring season of this year. Well, presumably, uh, when we, I have discussed some of the uh, process that's used to evaluate coaches, uh, it's certainly my understanding that um, that is taken into consideration. Uh, it may be that the board would like to look at that timeline and address it in negotiations as far as the contract is concerned. I've made some recommendations for other timelines for language in the contract about appointment or notification, which is somewhat premature from what is readily manageable. Uh, we have made a, a change in recommendation uh, as to the way in which coaches are paid uh, to be more consistent and more um, on a better timeline, that kind of thing. So. Okay. Do I hear a motion to accept the coaching and co-curricular positions for 1992-1993? Second. Further discussion? Some positions are not listed on, on this sheet. Is that correct? That's correct. Those are not yet filled. Okay. So it's not that they're listed with the blank. It's that they're not even, they're not here. That's correct. What's on this sheet are right. those positions that are being recommended. All, right. All in favor? I'm opposed. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm signing him. Okay, opposed. Okay, school board policies first reading. And this is for the teacher job share policy. <coughs> And we have an administrative guideline, long-term and short-term substitute professional staff employment. Rosemary. Yes, uh, Madam Chairman, I have a question regarding file GJ, teacher job share policy in paragraph one philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to know if the policy committee's intent uh, was to suggest that this review uh, with the maintenance of high quality uh, of education and services to students as a primary factor, if that be done annually? And if it were the intent, if it could be explicitly stated it in the third line? It says here that in the second paragraph, any proposal granted will be on a one-year basis only and may be extended beyond that time at the discretion of the committee. Uh, yes, I, I realize that, but when we're listing the philosophy, I just thought that it would be clearer if we stated that will be reviewed annually with the maintenance of. I mean, if it's redundant, I doesn't have to be there. I just thought it was more clear. Any thought? Well, I guess I don't, uh, I mean, I'm in favor of job share, uh, so I don't really feel uh, that I have to review that annually. Uh, but I, I would like to, uh, under policy, very definitely review the specific situations annually. I mean, it, if each one of our policy statements, uh, if we're going to put it in this one, our philosophy, wouldn't we really have to put it in all of them? And wouldn't we have to go through all our all our policies annually? And maybe we should do that. I think Who's the way on the it policy is. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're welcome to do so that. that. <laughs> I'm going to stop right now. I'm sorry, I said. It. You, you can we're be doing next it in for the first time in seven years. That's right. Sorry about that. Bad uh, idea. Yeah. I think there's a distinction between what is it philosophy and that's it, that we approve job sharing and and it's based on 
what we give our children, and that's the highest quality of education. And the policy is how we implement that. So I think there's a distinction. Okay. Other comments on either policy? Okay, this is the first, or one's a policy and one's a guideline. Um, all right, this was the first reading, so it will come back again next month for a vote. Okay, 1992-1993 school calendar. Well, this is one of those funsy <laughs> discussions. Um, there, as I looked at the calendar issues this year, it seemed to me that there were two major issues. Number one is when do we start school? Um, Labor Day next year is as late as it comes. Um, one of the issues that we try to, to inform you on, uh, I, well, let me back up a minute. I want to make it very clear, because I've had some conversations with teachers, uh, staff at the uh, building level on this, that uh, you are not being asked to vote on this tonight. Mm -hmm. This is not an issue um, that we have had enough time to really review or look at and so on. So if anybody's here thinking we're going to take a vote, no. Um, this is input time. The, um, one of the problems with the uh, Portland area ca school calendar is that there are a number of school districts that send to the Portland Vocational School. On the good news, that makes available uh, extra programs for us. On the bad side, it means that we have at least 17 sending schools that try to have a calendar that is at least roughly the same so that the kids who are actually going to the vocational school have a shot at having roughly the same number of classes. It's never been possible to have those calendars exactly coincide. Therefore, it is often difficult to, um, to uh, address that particular problem. When Labor Day is as late as it will be in the upcoming fall, uh, we find that many of the schools that do send to um, the vocational school start sending between the 1st of September or even sometimes the end of August, uh, in other words, the week before Labor Day. Uh, but this is particularly true for those districts that um, predict that they will need some extra snow days. So for instance, SAD 6 calendar has already been set, and it does start before uh, Labor Day. We have called around to try to find out how many districts have already set their calendar, or at least have a fairly close idea about what they're going to do, and frankly, it's all over the ballpark. Um, so <laughs> that's not much help to you. However, uh, we also researched to see what our own past practice was. Most of the time it appears that we have started after Labor Day, uh, even when Labor Day was quite late. And uh, we did find one instance of two staff days for a drug and alcohol awareness training session that was uh, given uh, a few years ago. Uh, other than that, we could not find, a, uh, at least in recent history, an example of starting before Labor Day. We, of course, do not usually have the snow day problem, uh, certainly not as much as, uh, as soon as having said that, next year will be the, the blizzard upon blizzards. Um, the other thing I have to say is that we carry 180 days in our calendar, 175 uh, student teacher days and five staff days. No matter how you put it, that's 180 days. And you know, if you start in August and you end in May or you know, somewhere around there, um, I suppose it doesn't make a lot of difference. The Labor Day issue, of course, does bump up against kids in, co in uh, high school who are working, and uh, we do, I'm sure, have some staff members who would be affected by that, and we probably have some family vacations and so on. Um, but calendar is a board prerogative, so you get to set it. I'm just trying to give you some information. That whole set of issues is one set of issues. The other set of issues is that uh, as we were putting the budget together, I heard from a number of uh, board members as well as some parents, is there something we can do to uh, alleviate released uh, days in the sense of uh, students losing time? And I said, well, we'll put some money in the budget and we'll see what kind of creative solutions we can come up with. I have had some uh, conversations with staff. We've looked at uh, various ways in which we might um, use that money to uh, to reduce the number of workshop days. Frankly, we've had a lot of other issues that we've been dealing with, and I do not have at this time what I consider to be a perfect solution. 
uh, I'd like to use the opportunity when we discuss uh, teacher negotiations to kind of share with you some of the suggestions that have been brought forward. Uh, I also want to take the opportunity to assure the staff that, that none of you are thinking of cutting out workshop days totally. You recognize that we are in a situation where we need that time. We're contemplating a lot of changes at uh, elementary math, or at least I won't say a lot of changes, but we're certainly contemplating uh, some additional need for staff training. Um, and we're looking at creative ways of doing that. But we do recognize that released afternoons are a difficulty in the sense that students do miss out on a certain amount of instruction. Furthermore, I have discovered in talking with staff that um, they can speak for themselves, and I see some staff members here, but at least those who are talking to me are concerned about the Friday um, afternoons, the release time. They feel that that does create uh, an increase in student absenteeism, um, and I'm sure some other issues too. So um, whatever we get into with a calendar, those two issues are the something, we, you know, where and when do you want to start, and also how far can we take the idea of um, reducing workshops but not losing staff development time? Thanks, Mayor. I'll go first. I gave my calendar away, so I'll be real brief. Um, the Memorial Day vacation was, I mean, the Mor Memorial Day holiday was not marked off with hash marks on mine. I don't know how that affect our days. I, I do want you to know that I strongly support beginning school on uh, September 8th. Uh, instead of the second for the reasons Connie has just mentioned and in uh, doing some work I found that 26 classrooms over the summer are going to have to be broken down and rebuilt plus or minus one we've never had that experience before uh, we have to have site work done outside of the high school building we have to get up to code we have to get permits there are, I've built a house I, I know that there are delays that no matter how hard you try you just have no control over um, I had uh, the business manager research how many uh, snow days we've had in the past five years. We've had one year of three, one was questionable, and two years as an average. Uh, also we have a two hour late start policy which I think we've only implemented once uh, in the five years so we have that option uh, to uh, really limit the impact of our snow days on lengthening the year into uh, uh, the 20th of uh, June but quite frankly my concern is um, the high school students who work uh, very often seasonal businesses give bonuses to the students who stay through the holiday um, the athletic season by the MSSPA of course we all know that they run our schedules and their seasons are set it has absolutely nothing to do with when school starts preseason is I believe it's the 19th of August this year so I mean that's not uh, an intervening factor and I also uh, strongly support because of uh, energy cost savings and also uh, because the um, uh, custodial staff gets eight full days during uh, the uh, winter break to uh, do a lot of the work that has uh, our damage, fix the damage that has been done in the buildings during September, October, November, and December. And that's a, a good opportunity for them to have the buildings pretty much to themselves. And um, that'll be it. Well, um, if we had the snow days, all five snow days, or even four snow days, we would not finish until the 29th of June. That's when we would be finishing school. I think that would be real difficult for people, for, for young people who get jobs to be able to get a job if they weren't even going to work until the last day of June. I, I, I think they could work through Labor Day and have another day off. They could sleep in the day after Labor Day because they wouldn't start to school until the Wednesday after Labor Day. And also another consideration is community services, uh, summer program for, for the the summer camps start have always in the past started the last week of June. Isn't that correct, Sue? And and depending on the snow days, there'd be that interference. So uh, this particular year, it, it seems to me that it would be necessary to start before before Labor Day for those reasons. Other thoughts? Yeah. I, I don't want to comment on that issue because I'd like to see how the public weighs in on that one 
uh, too about starting before or after but I, I would like to uh, commend the superintendent and the administrators and the staff who are, have obviously made an effort to address the early release situation I, I'm not sure that uh, this calendar is it's perfect yet but it's a step in the right direction so I think well we're I should progress I should point out that there mm -hmm. are probably some days that would be requested in addition to what's on here for early release I don't want to mislead you oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This so is sort of this is sort three? of a bottom line. Pardon me. There, there will be more than these. Three oh days. yes, I think that uh, in my again, I probably need to get into specifics um, as we discuss negotiations. But I do believe that um, there's a limitation on how much we can cut back on those, and I think it will take more than this. Peter. No, well, I have a, a strong personal preference, uh, probably being a traditionalist for starting after Labor Day. But I, I must admit, I don't have any idea uh, what the public uh, feels about this. Uh, I think it's unlikely that we would have five snow days, not impossible, certainly. But I think it's much more likely that we, we would be ending around the 22nd or the 23rd of June. And I don't know which whether that affects people who are getting jobs and making summer plans more or less than an earlier late start will affect people at the other end of the scale. Now, I guess my question is, how do you find that out? Uh, how do we find out from the community who is the, uh, w which is the least inconvenient? Well, I think certainly people can call us or the superintendent's office. I, I think one question that I have also is that kids have had a fairly long stretch to take a break from school and I wonder if the learning time at the beginning of September is more optimal than extending it into June where in the spring and early summer you tend to lose the learning time with a lot of kids because they've kind of tuned out. Well, the issue of Christmas, for instance, you can knock back a couple days there. Um, we have been using that as a two-week period with a couple of staff development days. We've chosen to put them into November because that is where we were trying to um, really focus on giving good quality time for parent conferences in November. Um, there are also... Um, you know, those kinds of things, you can move a couple of days around. I mean, Rosemary's given some good reasons why two weeks is nice, uh, for a variety of reasons, in-house reasons, but at the same time, uh, none of those things are uh, sacrosanct, and we can kind of move it around a little bit. Um, we I've could, heard, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say I've heard, I've heard a number of parents voice um, displeasure with two full weeks at Christmas, that they think that that's too long. Well, uh, as I said, this is one of those funsy issues. There's no real super answer. Uh, I think that the region needs to go to some discussion about um, changing calendar to a year-round calendar. Um, probably does have to be a regional discussion, as we've said and we've talked about it before, because of interscholastics, to say nothing of such shared facilities as a vocational school and, and some other kinds of ish considerations of shared facilities. Um, in the meantime, uh, one other possibility that this calendar does not reflect is asking the staff to come for a workshop day, uh, probably Thursday the 3rd with a four-day weekend, yeah, Friday, three-day, yeah, four-day weekend, right, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, and then starting school on the 8th. I mean, if you can kind of chip away at some of those issues, um, I have had some conversation with staff where um, they thought that might be acceptable um, in preference to having a very late June start, uh, June ending. But I don't know if that's a, uh, how universal that feeling is. Charlie. I just wonder how effective start going for school for three days and then they're off for three days and then trying to get back into a routine again for four, four days. days. That's kind of a, a jump start and I, I don't know how effective it's going to be. We talk about the quality of time. I see that a, those first three days is I know the first two to three days is essentially maintenance and getting kids oriented and that type of thing. But I just, I see a lot lost by, by three-day weekend and then teachers having to start over again. 
Well, except if you get them oriented on the second, third, and fourth, then when they get back on the eighth, they can start into a regular school. Rosemary. Yes, Connie, do you have an estimate of how much time it's going to take to break down and set up 26 rooms and if there's going to have to be overtime during the last two weeks of August to make a, a September 2nd start date? And well, can I, we get that? Excuse me. There's no way I can get that at the moment. I mean, there is a timeline that I understand was, you know, that I've just seen that was delivered today. Um, but the, uh, your, I think your, your common sense approach to this, that we know it's going to take longer than anybody ever tells us, is accurate, which would tend to, you know, when you weigh those things, um, trying to get into the buildings up and running and so on. I mean, you know, those, those, that's a very real consideration. Yeah. I just think no, no matter what we do, we ought to um, aim for finding big blocks of time that are not interrupted um, at all. There are so many weeks now that are interrupted by a holiday or early release day or workshop day or whatever. I, I would just like to see us try to build a calendar that had long blocks of sustained learning time, um, no matter what other things we're trying to accomplish. And one month, November, is. It's always November. That's, it's ridiculous the, what we have. We have a week of school. Essentially, we, ha we don't have school. We have a week of school. Essentially, we don't have school. And then we have four weeks before Christmas. I mean, how effective is that? Especially the start of another quarter. I just have one more. Why does a quarter have to end on a Friday? And why is the first quarter the shortest quarter? Is that just the way the weeks fall or is there a reason I mean why isn't every quarter 25% of 175 days and we don't have to discuss that now that's just one of my questions okay any other comments okay so we will <coughs> excuse me see this again next month Yes, and I just want to remind you that the, um, there is a, the way the statutes work on calendar, it is the board uh, that sets the student calendar. You have an advise and consult obligation with the Teachers Association for any impact of what you set for a student calendar on teacher working conditions. Also, of course, any days you set as teacher days are negotiable. So. All of this, I have tried to talk to staff, and um, again, I will share with you when we discuss negotiations any of the particulars, but I think that um, the, it is important for everybody to realize that uh, the bottom line, the final decision is yours, uh, and we are trying to follow the uh, advice and consult routine. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, the next item, discussion and possible action, the reorganization of grades at Pine Cove and Middle School. This is uh, the reorganization of uh, Pine Cove K through four and Middle School five through eight. Are there comments from the board? I think I would support, since we have now gone ahead and, and have made application to the state, so we've started that process of looking at a five through eight middle school. Um, we're starting to, to move the fourth grade back to the Pond Cove Elementary and moving the kindergarten out. We're starting to look at bus schedules and integrating the times and reducing some runs um, with the, with the middle school and the high school, and I think this is the appropriate time to finish the process and make it a five through eight middle school, and I would move to do so do so. Second. Further discussion? Peter. Yeah, I have one point. Uh, I'm a little unclear as to how this is going to be uh, administered. There was one comment, I think, that somebody wrote that uh, we're working as a team, uh, but uh, I, I'm just a little unclear as to uh, whether there's an overlap of administrators between the new elementary school configuration and the new middle school configuration? What we actually have, for all practical purposes right now, are three principals and three assistants. Uh, one assistant at the middle school 
uh, in practice is a part-time teacher, part-time uh, assistant that would be Phil Jewett. His title has not been assistant principal. His title has been instructional assistant, I believe, which is something that got changed along the years. Uh, but in effect, he has been acting as an assistant principal and has released time to, to deal with that. That's an issue. Part of reorganization would be clarifying exactly how to uh, list that, because right now that's kind of an inaccurate issue. It's not particularly a money issue. It might be small sums of money involved, but it's mainly a, a clarification issue. Um, the other two buildings now have principals and assistant principals, and if we go with a K-4, uh, 5, 8, 9, 12, um, I would certainly recommend that um, the current structure of principal and assistant principal, K-5, remain the structure for the K-4 group. Doesn't that create a a lighter burden on K-4 than presently exists and create a heavier one in 5-8. Uh, and 5-8 is precisely the group that's going to increase in size, if I recall. It does increase in size this year, which would be one thing to take a good look at the um, explicit duties of the sort of splinter person that is working in that area. The other issue, uh, however, is I would just remind you that kindergarten will be in a separate building so that the K-4 structure now has the additional, comp uh, even though uh, the intermediate union has been in a separate building and, and has, um, Nancy has been concentrating a lot of her attention with that. Uh, nevertheless, we now have a new situation with the kindergarten in an even more remote building, if you will, and it's something that we're anxious to make sure doesn't get lost in the shuffle somewhere. Thank you. Uh, I have a comment on that. One of the reasons I'm um, excited about the possibility of the K4589-12 is that we do have uh, an assistant and a principal at each um, school unit. The other part of that is that with your um, uh, teacher evaluation plan, uh, one, my understanding is one third of all teachers will be reevaluated this year, which puts an extremely a uh, heavy burden on the responsibilities of the principals to evaluate. Also, in moving the fourth grade, we keep saying back to the Pond Cove. I don't know when it was there last, but uh, we see whenever we uh, go to a lower side, we think it's backward. But um, moving the fourth grade over and also uh, realigning the fifth grade, once again, to the middle school, there's a tremendous amount of administrative uh, pull and, and time and planning. Uh, to do that, so I, I'm very comfortable this year with that administrative uh, setup. Before we finish the vote, are, are there parents here that would like to comment on this? Okay. All right. So it's been moved and seconded. Any other discussion? Um, I would just like for a clarification on Charlie's motion. Should we be voting for a uh, K4 58912, or is it enough to say a 58 middle school? And is the other assumed? I will, yeah. I will amend my motion to, to reorganize in a K4 58912 structure. Second. Okay, further discussion? All in favor? Okay. Thank you. Discussion and action on class size issues at fourth grade. This is an issue that we spent, uh, I don't know, over two hours, I think, at our last transition team meeting um, because, of course, what we are really doing uh, in trying to use the high school space uh, more fully and putting the kindergarten there uh, and creating some space for, Con uh, for Pine Cove um, and moving the fourth grade in there. The unfortunate fact of the matter is we don't have rubber walls. Uh, and although we can just about fit things, there are some pieces that don't fit as neatly as they might. Um, as we've looked at this situation, the uh, six divisions we currently carry at fourth grade will fit into the Pine Cove structure once we move the kindergarten out. Um, however, we also realize that we cannot fit both art and music in Pond Cove, and we're opting to recommend to move the music across the mall and send students there, but to keep the art um, a very central piece of uh, the building 
in the Pond Cove uh, structure rather than send kids out across them all. Uh, and for a variety of reasons, I think that is a, a good, or at least a reasonable solution to the, uh, the specials. We also looked at, is there any way we can realign space uses in Pond Cove, um, looking at special ed spaces and so on, but as we move fourth grade back in, we do need a specialist at that grade level, and um, frankly, that makes the best sense to um, locate them in that building with the majority of the students. So this boils down to a situation, do we have six divisions of fourth grade or seven divisions of fourth grade? If you go with seven divisions, and that is likely to be a situation where we're going to have to leave two of them at the middle school, current middle school uh, structure somewhere. Um, we have also looked at the possibility of using the six divisions, which given the numbers we have right now is about 23 students per grade. And uh, we did put in the budget for the uh, extra personnel. Um, and instead of hiring the extra teacher, using two teacher assistants. Uh, we, we also have a budget that has supported the two teacher assistants for grades one and two um, as an attempt and have had a number of discussions about trying to create a, um, a means by which we train paraprofessionals to work specifically with certain grades and teachers and to expand the classroom teacher's ability to give individual attention to students. Um, naturally, that's what you would expect from teacher assistants, but unfortunately, that doesn't always work as well as you think it might. It does require some extra time in planning ahead, uh, staff time. We would need to support that effort with some training in the summer and so on. Either way, um, I can tell you that I think that whether you add the section or whether you add the uh, teacher assistance, um, I would be comfortable that those are ways in which we would try to give more individual attention, small class size or teacher assistance. Um, perhaps the crux of the issue for you is whether you want all the fourth grades in Pond Cove or not. Do you want them as a unit or is it uh, acceptable for some to be in one building and, and as I say, I would never leave one group, but you might consider leaving two. Those are some of the issues I think you need to consider. Discussion. I have a question. Does music have its own room at Ponco? Yes, it does. Has there been consideration given to asking them, to, the music teacher, to wheel a cart from room to room for music? I think we've had some discussion about that. Um, I don't know if anybody, one of the administrators, wants to address it. That's a very good point, Loretta. When uh, we began to realize the dilemma that we were facing in terms of class size and numbers of rooms and, and meshing the two and so forth, I did go and speak with uh, Judy Page about that possibility, met several times with the Allied Arts team proper, and certainly uh, understand their concerns and would advocate for them in terms of uh, a, a specific space that they would need, that she would need or that the, the music person would need to deliver a, a real quality program. And of course that's, that's the feeling of the teachers uh, that it is most productive to have music in, a, in an identified space in a music room. We've done it, of course, in the past. And in 1986, fourth grade moved from uh, the Pond Cove building back to the intermediate unit. And uh, prior to that, I believe um, in 85, we had music in the classroom. I, I distinctly remember music, the, the music teacher coming into the classroom. And Was it satisfactory? Well, it it can work. It, it, it does take a great deal of, of creativity and ingenuity. It's not as um, part of the, the, uh, the enthusiasm that students express for a music program, of course, is getting out of their regular space and going to a different spot to, to experience that, that music. But it can work. The answer to that is yeah, it could work. I, I just, in a way, you know, it's five minutes to walk down to the music yep. room and five minutes mm -hmm. to walk back. It mm -hmm. seems like you'd have more time to actually do music and push the chairs back and sit on the floor. Or we talked about several options. For example, protecting a couple of rooms in the intermediate, un intermediate unit that might serve as an art 
art space and a music space in um, asking the arts teachers, the music and art teacher, to look at creative ways that they could manage their program. For example, the possibility of bringing the older students maybe over to the intermediate unit classrooms for uh, certain parts of the curriculum. They certainly travel uh, much more readily than the younger children might. That, that was one way. Uh, looking at the, uh, there's a, the room in, down off the cafeteria has previously served as a music room and there have been risers in there at certain times and, and I think people with older children have had their, their kids in there for music before. The possibility that that could be a uh, performing space, an, an area that the music program could, could use and access. So yeah, we've looked at some alternatives. I think if you move the mu if you if you move the music to the middle school, I believe that was the, and leave the art in the Pond Cove, it's going to be that much more preparation time to get those students to that class, and even more so in the winter time when they've got to bundle up. I would prefer to see some innovation of bringing the music to the classrooms. I think there's a lot of movement in these children's days. I think if you went and watched the number of classes that are constantly moving all day, you wonder how much effective time is, is taking place in the classroom. And that's from my own observation. Rosemary. Um, I, I have two things. One is just a comment, but Loretta, back then the piano was tough to get it from, but we have ramps now. Um, I have a question of Nancy, please. Uh, Nancy, when we uh, were addressing earlier this year, I believe in October or November, uh, maybe December, I'm sorry, the um, large uh, fourth grade classroom. Uh, the large number of students in the classroom? Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, the large number of students in the fourth grade classroom. Uh, I believe that it was the consensus of the teacher population for the fourth grade to request teacher assistance as opposed to another section. Is that a fair? Well, I would be remiss in just simply saying yes and agree to that. At that time we had, uh, we, we certainly asked for parent input and teacher input and teachers were very agreeable at that time given that, it, that the school year was underway and that was part of their uh, concern in agreeing to teacher assistance at that grade level. The teachers felt very strongly that they didn't want to give students an, uh, uh, the message that we, you're being asked to leave a classroom and we're setting up a new classroom and, and we really didn't have many volunteers. I think at the most, the, the, the general idea basically on the part of parents was I really would like to have a new classroom set up but please choose someone else's child to be in that classroom, not my child. Teachers felt somewhat the same way. They didn't want to be in a position to identify students to be taken out of classrooms to set up that room. Since that time, I did do a brief survey of teachers and to find out how the teacher assistant positions were working. The teachers were very enthusiastic about having the, T the TAs in place, and I got very positive feedback. So I guess the answer is yes. I have received some specific feedback from teachers who endorse teacher assistants, but with reservation. They 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 support the paraprofessional strand, but given their druthers, would choose to have more classrooms. And I would be remiss if I didn't share this with you, and, and I believe the board must have received a note, or in process of receiving a note from the fourth grade teachers. Uh, it's addressed, to, uh, I'm sorry, it's addressed to Connie Goldman, to Beth, and to, to me. Uh, the teachers at the fourth grade level discussed at length the options for next year, and they strongly agree that they would support having seven classes rather than six, if that's what you're getting at. Mm -hmm. So I, I really did want to share that. And does that include the fact that the whole team will not be together, though? Was that Good considered? Point. Because we share this position okay. with the full realization that two classrooms may be situated in the present intermediate unit complex. Okay. Yeah. Um, the present third grade class that will be next year's fourth grade class, this is a, a, a class where a teacher was cut last year. There's six sections That's right. of third grade. There were seven. 
and it was, it was okay to have six sections with this group of kids at third grade. Why do they need seven sections next year? Well, it's, it's the sense, I believe, of the teachers and, and the, they have expressed concerns for their ability to um, serve the children as well as they might. That it's the teacher's perspective that they feel the smaller numbers, that they could give uh, more individual attention to students, and that, that whole discussion that I think we're all pretty familiar with, uh, the lower the number of students in your classroom, the, num the, the more frequency, the more frequently you could meet with students, and I believe that's part of it. It seems to me that we're not talking about the difference between 17 kids in a room and 24 kids in a room. We're talking about the difference between 20 and 23. And when we had this discussion last fall, um, I'd like other board members input it seemed to me that the board philosophically was favoring the school system moving in the direction of having teacher assistance because the feeling was if you have 23 children and two adults plus parent volunteers to work with the children if the training was in place and they were used effectively the teaching time probably could be better used in that situation than one person with 23, or one person mm -hmm. with 20. And so to me, it, it's, it's a philosophical issue as well. Does the board wish to have, considering the, the space problems, smaller class sizes using more rooms, or do we want the system to start dealing with teacher assistance in training and, and utilizing them? I think that, um the piece that, that you've just mentioned, Jan, using that paraprofessional strand is an area that we have not really philosophically embraced here in the Cape. And it is one, um, one piece of this discussion that certainly administrators, I think, and, and staff will need to examine more closely. Given that we have put in the budget, and I think this is really significant, and I think it's something that we're, we may be overlooking the potential here. Given that we have in the budget a, the volunteer uh, coordinator position, should you as a board agree to uh, stay at six sections and endorse the two teacher assistants, Beth and I have, have uh, certainly committed to, as much education as we possibly can. We're looking to educate staff in ways that we can best use paraprofes that paraprofessional strand. And I think that we have to look at the ways that this whole uh, issue will impact many other, it, many other um, points of discussion that, that have come up just tonight. For example, early release days. Uh, not, um, excuse me, not early release days per se, but uh, release time for teachers. We had looked at when we initially proposed or discussed having teacher assistance, we had hoped to uh, look at ways that we could tap folks who were in place to pick up some of the responsibilities for in-class instruction, to assist teachers to the maximum, and to provide some release time for, the, for staff for some uh, staff development opportunities. That, that's another, another piece of that. We had hoped to have the volunteer coordinator spend time with staff and help us to appreciate ways that we can maximize a paraprofessional strand, for example, should you endorse them. It's, it's my sense that, and I would speak basically for, for some of us as administrators, we're not maximizing support staff ourselves. We need some assistance in that. We need retraining in that area. And I think that I, I would not be, uh, I certainly don't want to speak for staff, but I think staff would come under that category as well. I don't think we maximize the use of the folks that we have in place. What as other professions do, okay. I mean. Excuse me. What qualifications do you have to have to be a teach teacher's assistant? Well, to be a teacher's assistant, Technically, you, you need three years of college. 
that, that's it. We've been very fortunate in our system. Many of our teacher assistants have uh, undergraduate degrees, if not uh, masters in literacy. We have several who have masters in literacy. Uh, they're not, you know, the, these folks are well educated, basically. You mentioned that we haven't, as a system, embraced this, this policy of, of philosophy of utilizing mm -hmm. teacher assistants. Where have we used them in the past? Well, they've basically been used in our resource room positions. We've had, we have um, three in the intermediate unit who serve um, some, some middle school students and some elementary uh, in a composite room that we have. We have uh, one woman in a resource room position and uh, as basically as escorts sometimes or as tuto in tutorial situations. But we really haven't, uh, we don't have a, a, a teacher assistant strand basically. So we've used like more, more as do. a support of special ed than That's we right. have as, as a teaching strand. That's right. Mm -hmm. Anne. I, I think one thing we, we really need to do, and I said this at the transition team meeting, is um, teachers need to think um, about what it is that only they can do for the kids, mm -hmm. Deline delineate ex you know, what they have to do and what other people could reasonably do given some training. Um, I think that's a real important aspect of this. Or, um, you know, it's not just a matter of spinning off tasks, I think. I think we need to fundamentally look at the jobs um, that we're trying to do and see if we can divide out some aspects of them. Peter. I must say I'm surprised to hear you say that teachers having their druthers would like to have more teachers. Uh, based on my four years, uh, I've been exposed to just uh, an, uh, a large number of arguments in favor of teacher's assistance. And uh, I wish I could enumerate the lists of functions that you know, have been laid out that would take teachers away from uh, the important tasks for which they're highly trained, uh, which teacher assistants could perform. And uh, I'm sorry, did I say that backwards? Well, yeah. you know what I mean. Uh, and uh, it was everything from going to the copying machine to uh, taking attendance to, uh, you know, covering the class when the teachers were conferencing with other teachers. And uh, I'm just really surprised. Is that a sea change, or is my uh, recollection uh, faulty? Well, we just really haven't had them in place, Charlie. Uh, I mean, no, Peter, I'm sorry. We really haven't had them in place, so teachers have not had the opportunity to uh, understand or to, you, to have teach, uh, an assistant in the classroom to tap that, that market at all. So, I mean, it's not, I think it's, it's as Connie said when she first came here, that was, one, that was a piece that she was quite surprised at, that we did not have that strand at all. So I think that as a system, we have basically philosophically stayed with hiring teachers rather than looking at a paraprofessional strand. Well, this we have would had be a some change. because we've we've been obliged under our contract to hire a certain number. Uh, we have some, but as I said, they're the basically been in the past. They've been not in general classrooms, though. Uh, and certainly, didn't we uh, one or two budgets ago uh, cut out one or two, and there was a, a considerable amount of discussion and anguish over that. Kindergarten two years ago. I think you know one of the one of the classic issues here is that we're not trying to turn uh, teacher assistants into teachers. Um, the real issue is, uh, and I think it's kind of an interesting one, given the nature of the society in which we're all struggling to find creative solutions to very difficult issues. Uh, teachers have seen themselves, and I think parents support that view um, for a good reason as the motivational, inspirational, explanatory agent of children's learning in the classroom. Uh, we have felt that, you know, the, obviously if we could put the perfect teacher in every classroom, we wouldn't have any problems. Um, and hopefully that would be the case. But at the same time, the more I've looked at some of these issues uh, and realized the realities of the real world and limitations that we all have, um, uh, no matter how perfect the teacher is, uh, you get very tired working day in, day out with the energy level of, of um, 20 odd youngsters, uh, to say nothing of the kind of, of um, numbers that uh, secondary or middle school teachers see. 
and I think it's really important for us all to stand back and think about what it is we're trying to accomplish and how do we, what are the resources we have and how do we learn to use them better. It is, it takes a tremendous amount of initial overcoming uh, some of the setup issues for teachers to see themselves as managers of other adults. But if you look at uh, the degree of professionalism now expected of the classroom teacher, we had a presentation tonight about a very sophisticated form of diagnostic teaching of reading. We uh, can turn to science and math and see similar kinds of things. Uh, more and more teachers are expected to be curriculum experts and to be very clear about diagnosing from the clues the children give us about where they are developmentally in a certain kind of thing. No longer is the deaths and rows and uh, fairly cookie cutter assignments considered adequate practice. The only way we can give that kind of attention then is to rethink the resources we have. There are many pieces to that. One of them would for, be for teachers to be managers of other people managing children's learning. I don't mean by that to, to try to separate the teacher from the student by no means, but to uh, try to think in some creative ways about how are we ever going to do um, what sometimes seems like an impossible task, which is to up the real, genuine, educational learning that goes on for every child, not just those who kind of catch it quickly. That's, that's really what, what my thinking about this is, and I know from what Nancy's saying, which refers to my comments, um, that that's part of the conversations we've had. I don't want to underestimate the task this would be for teachers. We do need to support it. We, we're not just throwing another piece in there. We would have to take it fairly carefully, uh, seriously. Uh, I've had some conversations with some business people who have talked about ways in which they try to get personnel to look at using personnel, people who've always just done some, a task by themselves. How do you learn how to work as a team with other people? Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real quantum leap for some people to think that way. Charlie. Do we have some teaming in the fourth grade? Yes, we do. And we also had some t teachers who chose not to team. Yes, that's true. Okay. It seems to me, too, that, that thinking about the students, that one of the, the problems with having inter an intermediate unit was that fourth and fifth grade never really felt a part of Pond Cove because they were over mm -hmm. in a different building. So how can it be said that it could be to their benefit to have two classes over in the other building when, according to the teachers, this hasn't worked at all to, be, to feel like part of Pond Cove. And also, as one of the teachers mentioned at the transition meeting, that some of the fourth graders would feel like they were going over to the big school or the new school with the big lockers and the rest of the kids were staying behind. I just can't see an advantage at all to doing that. Well, it's not a recommendation. I think it's just simply a statement that that's the way they, they see it. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Charlie? No, I'll go. Okay. Is it possible for all the fourth grades to be at the Pondo School? Mm -hmm. You say one or two classes. If, if we increase to seven, then would, does that mean two classes, but there's one anyway? Or what, what's the thing? Increased, if you, if you decide to stay at the six, we could probably accommodate, not probably, we could accommodate six classes at Pond Cove. Without putting the, the, the arts at the middle school? No. We We'd would need to, to keep that? one classroom anyway for, for music, I would think, at, at, the, the, at the intermediate. I think that's really practical, that send those kids back and forth across the mall. Well, I don't know that we would necessarily do that, Loretta. We, what we would, what I assured and have agreed to uh, with Nancy Hutton to protect some space there because we certainly, a, a person delivering a program needs a space. Now whether or not this person is bringing the children to the space remains to be decided, but this person has to have a place to, to store instruments to do small performances should that should she decide mm -hmm. to do that or he decide to do that. So you're not saying it's necessarily the classroom? Not class necessarily. Right? That's, that's right. Their office. That's, that's right. Okay. Yeah. We yeah. felt quite strongly about the art because for art, of course, it's, it's messy and you need a sink and that kind of thing for kids. Yeah. My understanding is that the computer program is probably going to go on the road for fourth grade anyway. 
probably. Is that right? I would That's think what we're we, looking at. If we could do that with a whole bunch of computers, we probably could do it for music maybe some of the time, obviously for performances and things like that. You don't want to do that in the classroom, but I, w I would think we probably could come up with some ways. Um, but I also just think there, there has to be a really compelling reason to leave two classes in, in a grade level separated from from their compatriots. I, I, just, I don't think that's very fair to the kids, um, and I don't think it's necessarily <laughs> fair to the teachers not to have that, that uh, constant interaction that I, that I know they have now. Had, had you thought that if there were two cl classrooms, fourth grade classrooms still at the, uh, the old high school, mm -hmm. would you put a teams together, perhaps a team that was the working The thought had been that we would keep, if, if you decided this evening to go with seven sections and agreed or recommend or agreed or whatever, that, to, that there be a separation, we say two basically because I would not like to see one. I think one and I, is worse isolation than, you know, so we had thought a team. We would look for a team to stay rather than to, to self-contain. Sure. I'm just going to speak from personal experience. One of my positions is a teaching coordinator, and I thought I had to do it all. I mean, I thought I had to teach, I had to give the exams, I had to do the grading, I had to do uh, the workup to get the objectives ready for the students with that. And one of the things that I've taken on this year is a teaching assistant. And I, can't, and I had a lot of reticence because I thought I was the only one that could do it. And I could do it effectively. And what I found is by having a teacher assistant to do the testing and to do all the, a lot of this ancillary type of stuff, it's actually freed me to do more of what I'm there to do, and that's to teach. And I'm teaching on the college level. So I think it's an attitude and it's utilizing effectively the resources that you have. And I would strongly support putting, reducing it to six, six classes with the addition of two teacher assistants. Um, I agree, I, but I need a clarification. Do we have to make this decision tonight? Yes. Okay. Then well, I'm simply because they, they really, they need to move along. So many things are being held up in their planning. Um, then I'm prepared to make a motion when the discussion is. Yeah. Can I just, uh, this is kind of a peripheral point, but at some point I had raised whether it would be possible to use some of the downstairs rooms in the library um, for special ed or some of those other needs, and did anybody ever check that? Uh, we sort of, we did in fact look <coughs> at some of the issues, but I understand that uh, for both scheduling and possibly um, fire marshal regulations, we would have some problems. Uh, Madam Chairman, I move that we authorize the um, superintendent to reduce to six sections the fourth grade classes for next year to increase the class size to the appropriate levels to accommodate six sections and uh, to hire two teacher assistants for at the fourth grade level. And put all fourth grades at Brown Cove. And uh, under every circumstance, put all fourth grade classes at Pond Cove. Point of clarification. Uh, we have six, six sections seven. in the current third grade, so it's... Did I say reduce from? Yeah. I meant reduce. And at fourth grade. So uh, basically, uh, we have a budget that allowed for uh, an right. increase, and what we're, if, if I understand the, your motion correctly, what you're suggesting is that the that it remain at the same level. That it remain at the same level and we allocate that money that's in there for the teacher assistance if that has to be part of the motion. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Yes. Public input. Who would like to? Okay. I'm Barbara Powers, and I'm a parent of a current third grader, and I'm also a fifth grade teacher. Um, thanks for letting me speak for just a second. I can see where you're leaning, and I appreciate the thought that's gone into the, all of these proposals and your thoughts, but I would like to raise just a couple other things that you might think of, and as a parent, I've been thinking of a lot. Um, 
first of all, I'll start out by, by prefacing my remarks that obviously I would hope for uh, the smallest teacher-student ratio possible with professional staff or I wouldn't interrupt your vote. Last year, our projections for third and fourth grade were off and the classes ended up higher than we had hoped. We had certainly aimed for 22, 23 and ended up pushing 24, 5, and 6 in those grades. Um, certainly it was my anticipation as a parent that this would be fixed for the following year and certainly that's what our current fourth grade students are able to look forward to, moving from six sections in fourth to um, seven sections in fifth. I anticipated that the same would happen for my third grader. Um, there's been a strain because of those sizes and despite the wonderful uh, work of the teacher assistants at that level, the strain is there and I see it with my teaching colleagues and I see it with my son and I am quite aware that um, everyone was anticipating that we would go up a section and be able to place those children into smaller sizes. Let me tell you a couple of reasons that I feel kind of strongly about this. The fourth grade is going to be going through a lot of changes moving over. We've got kids that are disappointed, obviously, about not going. They will live through it. Uh, my son will live through it. It's sort of the playground is the biggest disappointment, um, and he can live with that. But they're also, we're going to be reducing for budgetary reasons a lot of things, including um, support at level two services for gifted and talented, all support in language arts, I think, from what I understand. So. Teachers are going to be receiving a lot less support in terms of differentiation for their youngsters at that age level. Larger numbers, no matter how many assistants you have in your classroom, are going to make it a lot more difficult to have a large variety of things going on for the children. I also think the numbers will probably be more like 24 and 5 if experience shows us anything that by the end of the summer our fourth grades will be at 24 and 5 again. Um, it's hard to do a lot of different activities when you have a lot of kids in a room and teachers by survival needs tend to do more whole class activities as a result. That tends to gear more towards middle of the class. Once again, we're talking about wide variety of instructional needs. In my fifth grade, I would dare say that we have ranges as much as five grade levels in language arts and math. And it takes a lot of planning, a lot of differentiated opportunities to serve children uh, adequately that way. Um, the other thing I would bring to your attention, and it hasn't been mentioned here, and it's been something that's certainly been on my mind as a former administrator, is the physical size of those classrooms. Right now, those rooms have usable space of about 700 square feet. The state minimum, minimum standards for classrooms are about 750 square feet for about 25 kids. Now, that's very close, and we're certainly well within guidelines. But from experience, again, I can tell you, add a teacher assistant, add a parent volunteer, and the room just comes right in on you. There is no space to breathe. We like to have room for classroom libraries. We like to have room for class meetings. And unless you literally use your space by having desks in lines, um, 23, 4, and 5 kids in those rooms feels like a lot. I've taught in those rooms. I've taught 20, and I've taught 23, and the difference was really pretty remarkable of having that many more kids in. And I also have had special ed teachers and remedial teachers come in the classroom with me at another adult, and you're really crowded. Um, for a while, the relief we used for that was to do some instruction in the classrooms, put tables right outside our doors and have some people work out there with kids. The fire department no longer allows that. We cannot locate tables in those hallways. So I guess I'm real concerned that in addition to real wide ranges of academic achievement these teachers are dealing with, their space constraints, constraints are really there. They're really remarkable, and it's something that I think we need to be cognizant of. I would say that despite the space uh, issue, if we could in fact have TAs come in and help, that at a minimum, two teachers would need to share one. Again, I've worked with having people come in my room in a sort of regular way, like every Thursday or something like that, and, and um, the inconsistency does not allow a teacher to really assign out the kinds of things, that, ways that we would like to use paraprofessionals. I would love to, at the minimum, share one with another teacher and to be able to develop at least half of my program to be able to count on another adult being present. A third of the time, or even a sixth of the time, if it went down to uh, one, really has to be more um, sit in and tutor this child, would you real quickly, please, while I run off and do this, and I'll be back to check in on you. You can't um, assign out tasks when there is inconsistent support in your room, and if the person happens to be sick or absent or whatever, you can lose two weeks as you go through. I would love to work with a paraprofessional, as I said, at some point, given the uh, correct amount of space and the correct amount of time that I could work with with them. 
So I guess um, ultimately, though, my biggest concern is the personal relationships that children have with their teachers. And that's the bottom line for me in terms of a really quality experience. Our teachers this year that are teaming, um, if next year uh, they experience class sizes of 24 and 5 instead of 20, that's 10 more children to plan for and to know intimately and to interact with every day instead of just three. So the, the teaming situations in particular I see as, as hard pressed um, when these get a little bit larger. I would say that there are some things in this life that we can be flexible about. We can be flexible, frankly, and I've seen it happen, about going back and forth between buildings. We can be flexible about being disappointed about playgrounds. We can be flexible about de being disappointed not to have a la carte lunches yet. But it's real hard to be flexible when there's time limits with children and you're dealing with, with many more numbers than perhaps um, is necessary. So in summary, I guess I'd say that I would really support staying at seven, figuring out the way we can best do that, whether two or across, or whether art travels, or music goes to the classroom, uh, whatever, to really stay at seven, to support those teachers who are saying to you, we are tired, the strain is showing, we would prefer seven sections. Um, there's going to be less support for their kids with, uh, with high ability needs. The classrooms barely meet minimum size standards. and. Um, I just think in general that the teachers are trying to give us a message that they feel that they will be at their most optimum in a year of change, being able to still count on having 20 or 21 students in their rooms. Thank, Thank you. you. Other parent input? Okay. We were voting. Uh, all in favor? I think that is that where we were? We had a motion and a second. Is that right? Okay. Further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Okay. okay. Consideration of a request by the superintendent to enter executive session for the purpose of discussing, nego discussing negotiations. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? <laughs> Anne? Oh, sorry. Okay, all right. The meeting's adjourned.